Hi, and welcome to Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Thank you for joining us. And as I usually always say, we've got a terrific show for you. Again, uh, uh, it's a real kick for me today to have the guest that we uh, have with us uh, today. Uh, originally, we were hoping to get him on last fall, and we were going to be doing a satellite feed, but uh, he is... Uh, uh, on tour, as they say, uh, uh, preaching the word and uh, doing many personal appearances. Uh, our guest today, Bernie Carbo, a former uh, Major League Baseball player uh, who has uh, written a book uh, called Saving Bernie Carbo, uh, co-written with Dr. Peter uh, Hunsis, and uh, again, talks about Bernie's life and as well as his uh, struggles with uh, drug and alcohol addiction and his uh, we'll call it a uh, second phase of life in which he's uh, found uh, Jesus Christ and uh, going around the country preaching uh, uh, the gospel and uh, the message that he uh, brings with all the uh, dealings he's had in his life. Bernie, thanks for coming by. Appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Love to have you. Um, basically, there, there are three themes from what I saw in the book. Uh, obviously, baseball being a, a, a big part of your life. At one point, even you mentioned about how baseball up to a point saved your life but as I came to realize baseball especially after you were done with your career was was not enough there was still something missing there um, the other uh, topic the second topic mental illness including addiction and then the third topic uh, which uh, again we'll uh, elaborate on at length later on uh, spirituality kind of finding yourself would you say that uh, that sums up the, uh, the the book as well as your life yeah I think Dr. Peter did a great job um, we spent a lot of time together uh, I, I stayed at his house for about uh, six or seven weeks and we went through a lot of taping and a lot of things that I've written down throughout my life and wanting a book to be written since 1989 and uh, Peter did a great job. Um, he put his taste on it, of course, but it's about, um, it's about the greatest game ever played, Game 6 of the 1975 World Series, 40 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> Larry, absolutely. it's a long time. I, I remember and, uh, it like it was <laughs> yesterday, I'm sure. Uh, well, you, yeah. you'll talk about that as well, yeah. And uh, Peter taste, puts his taste on every chapter, and it's amazing that um, Peter... Uh, I met Peter in an unusual way. We had a, a, a banquet for the 75 Red Sox and people had to buy a ticket to sit with their favorite ball players. And 22 years ago, of course, that Peter bought a ticket to sit at my table. And it was, it, it was great because, you know, you think as a player, how many players, you know, how many people are going to like you, who doesn't like you, and to sit at a table where they paid to sit with you. And that's how I met Peter and Linda. And we got to be really great friends. They would come to the fantasy camp. I would stay at their home when we came into Chumsford, and he's a teacher at Low Mass, and it's a wonderful opportunity. And we were sitting at his home, and he says, you know, I'd like to write your book. And I thought, wow, you know, I, this would be great. So we thought about it, we prayed about it, and the Lord led us to it. And I went to stay with Peter for, like I said, about six or seven weeks. We did a lot of taping. It took him about a year and a half to write the book. Uh, very unusual book because it's a sports book it's about my life it's about a number of different things but after each chapter he puts his taste on it because he's you know he's a doctor and he's in psychology he teaches psychology and I think it's a, a great book I think it's he's done a tremendous job it's an easy read uh, matter of fact you know it's amazing that my daughter my oldest daughter read the book and uh, she called me last week she says you know dad as I read your book, I cried a lot and I laughed a lot and I, I remember the times that we did so many great things together. But she said, wouldn't it have been nice if our family would have known Jesus Christ all our lives because we went through so much. But um, Peter and I uh, are still friends. Uh, he, he's, um, I'm staying with him now at Chelmsford and we're traveling around doing things in the Diamond Club ministry. You know, I speak in jails, prisons, detention homes, halfway houses, boys and girls clubs, churches and I do men's breakfasts, and I speak about my life. I speak about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how my life has changed. And I went from not knowing God, not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, growing up as a child. Larry, you know, um, I wanted to play ball. 
And I'd get up and want to go play ball, and I play. We play all all week. We lived by a park and had baseball parks. My dad wanted to live there because he wanted me to play ball and sports, and had all the things that you could have as a little boy. And we'd go down there and play ball. But when Sunday came, there was nobody to play with. Right. And Larry, I asked my mama. I said, Mama, you know, nobody's nobody's home to play ball. And she said, Well, it's Sunday. They're all in church. We don't believe in God. In all bad people go to church. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I said, well, wow, that's, uh, so I grew up thinking that people that went to church were bad people, because that's what my mom told me when I was young. And um, so it was an experience of to go back and to talk about my childhood, which you'll see some things that happened in my life as a child, and then to grow up to be the ball player, and then become the ball player and thinking that the, major, the, the world was going to make me happy, uh, hitting home runs in a World Series, making some money, having a good house, a nice house, having a beautiful wife and children, and playing baseball in all the cities I played, playing with the great ball players, and thinking this home run was going to bring me that joy and peace and bring that, uh, fill my heart up. And my heart was so empty. Mm -hmm. And even finding out that nothing was making me happy, wasn't satisfying me, and I was searching for everything the drugs, the alcohol, the sex, and women, and the, this, that world, and that baseball life that I lived, and thinking that it was going to bring me some joy. And the only joy that came in my life was understanding that I ended up, my mother committed suicide, my dad died, I went through a divorce, I was contemplating suicide, and I ended up getting a call from Bill Lee, and I ended up getting a call from Ferguson Jenkins, and Next thing you know, Sam McDowell calls me from baseball assistance team, and the next morning I'm in rehab. Wow. And of course, after 28 years of doing drugs, I really didn't have a problem. And not having a problem, I went into rehab and I signed in, talked to the psychiatrist and psychologist, and got my room and got my key, and I said, you know what, I don't have a problem. You need to give me my key to my car so I can go back home. <laughs> I don't have a problem. And they said no. And I had an anxiety attack because I didn't want to be there. I didn't have a problem. And next thing you know, I'm being driven to the hospital, Tampa University Hospital. And I go into my room and I get a telephone call. I'm thinking, you know, I really thought I was having a heart attack because I never had an anxiety attack. And there's an old man who listens to the conversation because rehab called me, asked me if I was in the room and how I was doing. And he looked over to me and he said, are you an alcoholic and a drug addict? And I'm thinking to myself, you must be listening to my telephone call. And then he asked me, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And I told him, I, I don't know who Jesus is. I, I, I'm, you know, I've never been to church, and, and I haven't read the Bible. I don't know what the Bible is. I don't know Jesus Christ. And he said, come and sit next to me. And he gave me the gospel of Jesus. He was asking me different questions about the Lord, reading the scripture, reading the Bible. And he said, did you realize that you're a sinner? I said, you know, my, my grandpa told me he was a good man. My daddy told me he was a good man, and I'm a good person too, yeah. even though my, the alcohol and the things that ran through my family and, and as my grandfather, my grandfather was an alcoholic, my dad, and, you know, all the abuse and, and committing adultery and everything, all these things were happening. And he said, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created you, Bernie, in the image of God and the likeness of God, and that you were born of the first Adam, and you were born into that sin nature, because God told Adam not to eat the tree of good and evil. And he ate of that tree, wanted to be like God, and evil came into the world. So I could understand that I was born into that sin. Mm -hmm. Then he said to me, you need to be reborn again. I said, my mama, told me, <laughs> my mama told me I couldn't be reborn again. He said, well, you need to repent and understand you can be born of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. And the next thing I knew, the, the nurse came in, they want to do more tests, and they want to run more tests on me to see how my heart was doing. And I left, and I came back. And he said, you know, you need to be reborn, and you need to pray. And I looked at him, and I was very serious. I said, you know, the only time I've ever prayed is that when I was so stoned and drunk and everything, laying on the floor, thinking my heart is going to come out of my chest. I always pray that at that time, God, don't let me die. Right. And then go right back into the drugs and, and every day, every day, and every day. And he said, you need to pray to take Christ in your life. I prayed with the man. I prayed with the gentleman. 
and I took Christ into my life, and then after three days, it was time for me to leave. And I asked the man, I said, you know, I don't even know your name. And he said, the only name you need to know is Jesus Christ. And he handed me my first Bible, and uh, he said, all that you do will be added to me. And as I was being wheeled out, I asked the nurse, I said, who is this man? And he, she said, he's a Baptist preacher. I said to my thinking of myself, God had to put me in the hospital, 150 beds. He put me with a preacher <laughs> that gave me the gospel of Jesus and, and turned my whole life around at that particular time. And to be reborn and to be forgiven and there's no condemnation in Christ and to be a new person and a new creation. So I ended up being wheeled out and I said, he's a Baptist preacher. And as I'm being wheeled out, I went back into rehab. It was a, wasn't a 12-step Christian program. And a gentleman came to me and he says, I know why I'm here today. This is my first day. I'm a Christian and I'm here to disciple you. And I had no idea what discipleship was. Mm -hmm. And as I looked at him, the Lord just showed me something that I suppressed for about 38 years of my life. At this time I was 43 and I must have turned white. And he said, what is going on? And I said, I don't think I can talk about this. And as I sat down, he prayed with me. And I said, you know, when I was a little boy, my oldest cousin molested me. And I'm just seeing this. And he said, we need to pray. And I prayed again. And I had to work my way through that three months of working through that because I suppressed it. I remember as I was seeing it, as I came out of the bathroom, my mother said to me, we won't talk about this. And that was the last time that anyone stayed in my house. I was, she kept me protected. I was an only child. Sure. And so for me to see that, God had to show me and break that hardness of my heart and that pain and heal me the first thing that needed to be healed. Then I had to understand my mother's suicide, my dad's death. I had to go through the drugs and the alcohol, the anger, the bitterness, the pain. <clears throat> and I worked for those three months in this program and it was amazing. It was just an amazing thing that this gentleman who was a Christian worked within me that, that period of time, those three months that went by. And uh, I buried my mother, buried my father, and I realized that, um, you know, even though my mother committed suicide, and yet I was the problem, I really didn't, I didn't commit suicide. I wanted to die, and yet I was alive. And I take responsibility, but... I, I really look at it now that I didn't kill my mother. My mother took her life, and then my dad died. It, it was a tremendous thing for me to go through, but by the grace of God and having faith and believing in Christ, um, this gentleman worked me through it, and uh, it was a great journey. It was a journey that uh, started, Larry, and for the three months when it was time for me to leave, I didn't want to leave. Right. I didn't want to leave rehab. I, I wanted to stay. And the reason I wanted to stay, because I felt comfortable going back into the world. I was scared that something would happen. Uh, one of the things I knew, I had to get into a good church. I had to be continuously discipled. And when I went back into the world and I was traveling home, I had going away, I had a flat tire. I mean, a mile and a half, two miles outside the rehab, I had a flat tire. And as I went to look at my spare, it was flat. So I had to walk all the way back to rehab. I had to borrow money because I had no money. They'll get two tires and whatever. But eventually, as I got home, uh, the neighbor came over and said, Carl Schillings wants to speak to you. And I didn't know who Carl Schillings was. At the time, I, I found out that he played for the San Francisco Giants in the minor leagues. Uh, he was a Christian, loving God. And he came over that night. I called him, and we started the Diamond Club Ministry uh, to teach the greatest game and to tell the greatest story, and that's Jesus Christ. And after about 14 months, he left to go to Westland College in North Carolina to coach baseball, Larry. And what happened was I, I went to, back with my family and my children and those friends and things, and I relapsed. And I relapsed really hard for three weeks, and it was a really difficult time. And I was seeing a um, Christian psychiatrist at that time, and as I went in to see him at that time of my visit, I told him I relapsed. And uh, he got very angry, started um, throwing books around, said, you need to get on your knees to pray to find a, a good Christian woman, find a woman that loved God. So I started praying, even though I was trying to 
have my family, my daughters, my wife, and my friends love me, you know, going back into that world. I started praying, and I went to my pastor and, uh, in church, and I told him I relapsed, and I told him I was praying, and something I had needed to go to an anchor house was uh, where uh, I went at times to work with young men mm -hmm. and play basketball and pool and play baseball and just meet with them and just love them where they're at and to tell them about Jesus Christ, how my life has changed. And when I went there, I told the pastor that I relapsed. I didn't think God loved me anymore. And it, it was time to have lunch, and I was walking down the hall, Larry, and he said, oh, I have to leave, but I want to introduce you to a young lady, and it was Tammy Yon. And as I looked at Tammy Yon, I said to her, I said, God's told me you need to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me, and she said, God hasn't told me anything. Oh, wow. And uh, so we went to lunch, and she was, uh, uh, had a master's degree in psychology. And I said, well, can you counsel me and be my friend? And she said, no, I'm, you know, I'm not able to do both. And I said, well, how about being a friend? Well, as we were talking, and I went out to the car and got all my drugs out of the car because I was still relapsed. Mm -hmm. And I got all the drugs, brought them in, gave them to her, and she listened. And of course, as she looked at her list that she wanted for a man to be a husband, um, she was divorced for 12 years. She was raising her son, Christopher. He was 12 years old. You know, there was no checks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, she went into the Bible and said that, you know, God said that uh, God's ways are different. And we, after four months, we ended up getting married. And uh, Christopher came to me and said, I want your name. And I thought, well, okay, Carbo. And no, he says, I want to be called Bernardo Christopher Carbo, Jr. Wow. And at 12 years old, uh, he kept our marriage together. He was a warrior. He was a prey warrior. Uh, he's 33 years old now. He's got a doctor's degree in clinical psychology. He's in the Army. Um, Tremendous man, married a beautiful woman, and um, they have a little baby girl, um, just beautiful. He She's, sounds like a chip off mama's block. Oh, that. yeah. He's, uh, yeah, he has his doctor's degree. He's in the Army. He loves it. The uh, little baby's name is Bristol. She's about six months old, and she's just beautiful. And so it's been a journey. Um, so right now, where I'm at, after 21 years of being sober, uh, being reborn and loving God and loving the Lord. I've gone through a number of things to learn about myself. One of the things, Larry, you, you, you have to be very honest. Um, you you got to take everything out of the closet, and you got to be honest with God, and you have to submit it to God. We have a God that loves me. And he shows grace, but he also has a judgment to where, you know, you're a sinner, and you can be judged, and, and there is a consequence for your actions. But through that grace, I have worked through so many different things, which I'm continuously working, even today, to renew my mind and to allow my eyes to see the things of God, to edify and build up the things I say, and to allow my heart to be very careful because it's very deceitful, but to be true, and also my flesh, and to have to die daily. But the Bible, the Word, and being in the Word, and knowing being in prayer, and uh, being in church, and having accountability, and... What I had to do, I took, I took what I knew in baseball. You know, when I first started being a baseball player, I worked really hard. I played five years in the minor leagues. I ran. I took, and Sparky Anderson, in 1968, they wanted to make me a pitcher, and it was the number one draft choice in 65. First year, first year of the draft, 50 years ago, yeah. <laughs> number one draft choice for Cincinnati. I had three terrible years in the minor leagues, and Sparky said, look, you're not going to be the village idiot anymore. We're going to make you a baseball player. You're going to be at the ballpark at 9 o'clock. You're going to be back here at 9. You're going to be back here at 3. And I thought, wow, this guy's crazy. He's going to kill me. And what happened was he took me from third base and moved me to the outfield, hit me hundreds of fly balls, threw to me, my hands would bleed, running the bases, learning the fundamentals, learning to win, making the uniform important. And I worked so hard for the next two years. And um, I hit 280, 289 with 20 home runs. The next year I hit 359 with 21 home runs. Sparky gets his job with the 1970 Cincinnati Reds, a big red machine. He brings me to spring training, brings me up to the big leagues. I hit, I hit 210 with 21 home runs. I have a rookie at Sporting News Rookie of the Year. And so what I did was I, I looked at what I had to do in those years and all the things I had to do to become that great baseball player 
and I did that with, with the things as a Christian life. I started writing the things that I needed to do. Get up in the morning, get on your knees, pray and give God grace and thank you and, and love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And then reading the word of God and then putting on the armor of God, dying of your flesh and going out in the world and doing the things. Reminding myself, continuously working. And I fail. I failed a lot. You know, the thing about it was, when I lived in the world and I lived with Satan, it was very easy. To be a Christian, is, <clears throat> it's very difficult, Larry, to be a Christian and be a man of God. It's not an easy thing. And I had to practice, and I had to continue to practice and do the things that I believed that God wanted me to do to where it became something that became a natural thing to when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I do is get on my knees and pray to the Lord. Then I read the Word of God, and then I pray to the Lord, and as I leave and as I'm being tempted, I know it's the name of Jesus, and all these different things. And, and reading the Word and the truth and living in the truth, it's been a journey. And, uh, you know, as I said, I confess my sins more today as a Christian because I live in this world, and it's, it's hard in understanding that I'm a sinner and I sin, and, and, and it's by the grace of God that I can go to him and say, you know, I, I, I forgive, ask for that forgiveness. And by doing that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and when you cleanse yourself in that relationship with God, that you're reborn, and he created you for the glory of God, and, and to give God the glory, and, and, uh, and understand that, that personal relationship with the Lord, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, so it's been a wonderful journey. I'm so happy in understanding. And, you know, my grandchildren were living with me for 10 and 12 years. And my three daughters are doing well. And so it's been a, a great thing. And it's been an understanding that uh, it's been a, a journey that's been an awakening, to be honest and be truthful, of what I dealt with as a child. And the book itself, Saving Bernie Carble, talks about my child life. Matter of fact, the book starts in an unusual way. It talks about my father living in a coal mine, uh, West, West Virginia, Virginia, in Helen, West Virginia, as a young boy, and doing something that my grandfather didn't understand, and hanging my dad by his feet off the porch, and allowing him to be there for hours. And you look at that dysfunctional, without Jesus Christ, without God, and my family didn't believe in God, and what happened to my father, and then seeing what happened to my mother when her father died in the coal mines, and she had to leave school at the seven years old and work in a boarding house, and see all the different things, and then realize that what I was born into as an only child, uh, the nurturing and the love. My mother loved me very much, she, you know, but my mother worked. Right. I mean, my mother went to work from, at 5.30 in the morning, didn't come home at 3 o'clock, from Five years old, uh, uh, the book will tell you I lived with my aunt, which was beautiful. She nurtured me and took care of me. But when we moved, I was in the fourth grade. My mother and father working. I'd get up, go to school myself, come home to an empty house. And they'd come home and then have a meal and then go out and play. There wasn't a lot of conversation. Right. There wasn't a lot of things going on. But, you know, it's, um, I've learned a lot from this book. I read it three times myself, <laughs> and I love the psychology of it, and I can see when a child is born, it needs that nurturing, it needs that love and that affection and that touch, and, and as a, a family, they, they need that spiritual, and, and they need to know Jesus Christ and, and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to raise that child and to be in a church and have the accountability. It's just something that I don't look back, Larry. I really don't. Yeah, I, I really look I think forward. The same way you have to always, no matter what. Yeah, what, you got to say card you're dealt. You always have to look forward. Yeah, I I keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, it, to be an alcoholic and drug addict, there's never a time that I take my eyes off of Jesus. There's never a time that when I'm tempted that I have to say the name of Jesus Christ, and I have to be in the Word. Uh, I'm just one drink from being an alcoholic. Uh, I'm one drug from being a drug addict. By the grace of God, I know that I'm a child of God, and I'm forgiven. See, the thing about it, there's no condemnation in Christ. I don't look back and pick up that luggage and try to carry it around. I don't stand here and tell you, Larry, that uh, my name's Bernie Carbo. I'm an alcoholic and drug addict. Right. I I'm sorry. That man has died. 
I tell you, I'm, my name's Bernie Carbo, and I'm in the family of God, and God loves me, and I've been reborn, I've been covered by the blood, and God sees my sin no more. And I don't, I, I, that's a freedom, that's a joy that I have in my heart that that man has died, and I've been reborn, and I have that understanding that I can move forward in my life and have that joy and peace and understanding. I, my wife and I, you know, we struggled for three, four years, and, and we had a lot of baggage, and, but as Christ knows, my son prayed on my lap and prayed for us, and he was a tremendous little boy and a man as he grew up, and our marriage is uh, solid now, and we travel together in the Diamond Club ministry, and she sings now, and she sings the gospel, and we travel. This is the first time that this year that we've been traveling by ourselves, and we have been, she's been raising children for 32 years. Right. I've been raising my grandchildren. We've been in the ministry 21 years. We've always traveled with our grandkids. And now that we're by ourselves, we're enjoying ourselves. We're really having fun. Uh, we're in this area right now, in, in this area. We're speaking at churches and doing some men's groups. You were just in Plainville, if yeah, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I was in yeah. First Bible Church of Plainsville. I did uh, a men's breakfast. I did a baseball clinic. Spoke Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, tomorrow I'll be in Worcester. I'll be in a, a jail in the 12-step program talking to guys in jail and prisons. And it's an amazing thing that what God has done. You know, hitting a home run 40 years ago, the greatest game ever played, Major League Baseball, Sporting News, and Major League Baseball picking it as a game six. You know, it's an amazing thing. Me hitting that home run as lost as I was into the drugs and the world and alcohol and whatever. God has used that home run, especially when the Red Sox won the World Series in 2004, 2004 and 7, 7 and 13. And 13 yes. So every time they win, it opens the door for that 1975 pinch hit home run. Now, if you look back at that pinch hit home run, you will see the worst swing that any man could ever take. I took the ball right out of Bench's glove and the ball just tipped, just dribbled and Johnny Bench looked at me and said, it looks like the worst Little League swing I've ever saw. And Pete Rose said, it, it, it was the worst swing any Major League hitter could ever take. And Rico said, it looked like a pitcher hurt his arm trying to learn to hit. And then the next thing I know, Zimmer just turned his back and said, he's got no chance. But the one thing that Bench said to me that is remarkable, he said, you know, Bernie doesn't remember his last swing. Well, he threw me a cut fastball. I took it right out of his glove. The umpire called it a a ball and benches arguing. I'm thinking I struck out. I'm thinking he's going to come back with a fastball, and I hit it. And as I'm running the bases, I'm running them as fast as I can. I see Geronimo turn his back, and it's a home run. I round second base, and I'm yelling at Pete Rose, don't you wish you were this strong? Don't you wish you were this strong? And uh, as I stepped on home plate, uh, it's amazing. Who would ever thought, you know? But the fact is, the sad thing about it, I didn't even know I batted another time and struck out right. until my wife bought the film and I looked at it because I lost a time at bat. I said, oh, man, I struck out. I don't remember that. And she said, yeah, it would have been nice if you hit another home run. Yeah, which, <laughs> which of course, then um, yeah, either Carlton that Fisk. inning or an inning or two later, then, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, Carlton Fisk's uh, you know, uh, tremendous home run off the pole, now known as Fisk's pole, but... Without your three-run homer, which was the dead center field, you know there would not there would not have been a game seven. And even though the yeah. Red Sox lost the series, it's still again as many have said, Major League Baseball Network calls it the the greatest game ever played. It also helps that it's it's captured forever on videotape. But uh, just uh, great stuff, and it's nice now that in later years that you're able to appreciate and enjoy it because as you said. At that time, sometimes things were a little, a little hazy, you know. You know, I always tell Colin Fitz, I put him in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really amazing about that home run, Larry? I believe I hit my home run. It's either the 21st or the 22nd. I really don't know. But I hit that home run before midnight. Yes. And Carlton Fitz hit his after Just midnight. After midnight. So I take. I say, Carl, you hit the greatest home run on the 23rd, but I hit the greatest home run on the 22nd. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Saving Bernie Carbo. Bernie Carbo, our guest, co-author with uh, Dr. Peter Hansis. Um, again, just to give you a little bit of uh, background information. Uh, of course, Peter' uh, parents grew up in West Virginia. Again. Uh, 
uh, addiction, childhood abuse, trauma, things that I think a lot of folks can relate to uh, that is, as you said earlier, is almost generational. Sometimes those things are hard, those cycles are hard to break uh, from one parent or a grandparent. I know that there was, uh, you talked about before, uh, was it your, uh, your father, how, you know, they used to strap a uh, gentleman that was your grandfather because he too drank and then they literally strapped him to the chair because he could be abusive as well. Right. So again, these things kind of sometimes fester themselves. And again, it just, uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, maybe it just re repressed things that everybody remembers. Like there's passages in the book where obviously, um, you know, you had almost like nervous tics. I'm surprised, I don't know, did you ever stutter as a boy? Because I mean, no, a lot I of folks, that, a lot of, you didn't talk, so there you go. But a lot of folks that go through well, yeah. parents yeah. that sometimes can be maybe abusive or have their own yeah. substance issues, they, you know, they develop these things. And I think, as you said earlier, what Dr. Peter captures so well, being uh, obviously the expert he is, is that he kind of then analyzes at the end of each chapter, you know, why then one thing led to another. For instance, you're uh, self-admitted poor performance in school. Okay, I can relate to that because, you know, I used to think of myself as a C plus student. I had parents that were immigrants, so of course they, you know, like your mom, for instance, in some ways, maybe couldn't help me with certain things. Lord knows today with technology and everything else, a kid would be like, you know, would be so far behind the eight ball, you know, especially if they didn't have affluence and have the uh, ability to reach out to those things. Plus, in, in those days for both of us, there weren't like the counseling and, and or people kept things kind of hidden in the closet. You talked before about the, uh, you know, the uh, incident with a family member where, of course, you know, oh, that's it, you know, like toss yeah. that key away. And again, these are things that all, you know, just built up, built up to where then, you know, it, it's it really is a, an amazing story that that you are here to tell it today, because, as I said earlier, despite your love of baseball, Clearly, you would admit that that was not enough. Having a Sparky Anderson, who you speak of literally like your second father, and all he did for you, that in the in the great scheme of things, that still wasn't enough to get you over the hurdle. It, it took you know many many different roads, and then of course you're you know you're finding religion to to uh, help you guide the way. And then look at all the people you talked before about being um, in a facility, and then. Uh, uh, all the folks, the, the, the preacher, and then the other gentleman that helped you. And then still, you know, it, it's, it's a tough road. I cannot speak from it uh, personally, but again, I think of folks like, uh, you know, Dwight Gooden, uh, people that we know who were sports figures. How about all the folks that are just regular folks like, you know, our viewers and myself that, again, they go through all these different twists and turns and they don't know where to seek help. And then this is what, through this book and through what you're doing with your ministry, you're giving people something to maybe reach out. You know, you're in your own way re giving back to people for all that now you have. It's been, a, it's been, um, it's amazing that when I do prisons and jails and I'd go into 12 step programs, you know, one of the things that you have to do, you have to be honest with yourself. Did Bernie Carbo have a problem? You know, I remember I said that when I went into rehab, of course, I didn't have a problem and had an anxiety attack. I had to be honest with myself to say, you know what? Yes, I'm an alcoholic and drug addict. And yes, I have a lot of problems. And the thing about it was that I didn't know about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And through that understanding of who Christ is and who God is and how I was created in his image and his likeness to, to be more like him, that... You know, I had to be reborn in, in that instant when, when somebody gave me the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God came in on me, and, and I understood that my life had to change. If, if, you know, I say that God pulled me right out of the grave. The only thing that was left was my hand, and God says, No, son, I have a lot of works for you to do. I want you to go tell people what I'm going to do in your life. So when I started the ministry... In 1994, whenever I went to speak, I, I talked about what God was doing in my life. And now, after 21 years, a lot of things that I talk about is the Word of God, being honest and be truthful to yourself, and, and know the truth. 
I, I, I don't want to beat anyone down. I just say for you to go and buy a Bible, read the Word of God, and seek the truth, and you will understand the truth. That if whatever you're going through, I honestly believe that in Jesus Christ and through God, that you can turn away from the things of the world, and, and you can live a different life and, and, and understand that life is so much better. I think sometimes we don't want to give up the things that we think. We don't want any change. I really didn't want to give up the alcohol and the drugs. You know, I didn't want to give up that type of life. But what happened was I was dying. And then I, I felt that, you know what, I don't want to die. I really don't want to die. And God just worked it to where Bill Lee calls me. I, I, we don't talk. And then Ferguson Jenkins calls. You know, and Fergie just lost um, his wife in a car accident. Uh, his nanny took his little baby in suicide. And when I talked to Fergie, I couldn't tell him that I wanted to die. Mm. And all these things worked. God had that working. And then Sammy Dow called me. And next thing I know, I end up in the rehab. And man in the hospital leads me to the Lord. <clears throat> and I was ready for that. But I, I want people, and I want when I speak to Christians and I speak to people in the churches that, who are believers in God, I always say to them, love a lost person to Jesus Christ. Love a lost person. Be the light. Be the salt of the world. You know, love them where they're at. You know, because I think when you, you look at a man as such as myself, after I relapsed, uh, I would think people would say, well, look. Look what, look what happened. But people are always, especially in today's world, they're always looking for a shoe to drop. You know what I'm saying? They're always, oh, yeah, see, you know, many times like some of the folks we spoke of earlier, again, instead of trying to be supportive or, or better off say nothing, if you can not say something positive right away, you know, and the media picks up. But again, the media and the people, it's all, it's all intertwined. It's just, so, you know. They've been watching Bernie Carbo for 21 yeah. years. <laughs> They know the Bernie Carbo, and it's amazing to me, the players that I played with, I, we had a 40-year reunion, and one of the players said to me, it's amazing that you're alive, Bernie. There you go. I said, by the grace of God, by the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm alive. Yeah. He said, you know, I, I've been watching you for the 20, 20, 21 years, and I see such a change in you, but I know the life that you lived. I watched you and played with you, and I knew, I felt that there was going to be a time that you would die. And, and felt that, you know, and seeing you now, I look and watch, and I see that your life has changed and how happy you are and what joy you have and what peace and understanding. And yet, he didn't understand it. He, he watches me. Everyone watches, and, and no matter where you're at. And, and that's the thing about it is that it's Christ in me, not Bernie Carbo. It's Christ that lives through me by the Spirit of God that I ch choose to live that life and walk that walk. And I want people, to, I, you know, players that I played with Cincinnati, St. Louis, and I played in all the teams, Pittsburgh and Cleveland. Milwaukee. You know, they know that man, Bernie Carbo. I mean, there were things in the book that I didn't even put. You know, Alex Grammis was managing me in, at Cincinnati. And when I slid in the 1970 uh, World Series, I slid in the home plate. Elroyd Hendricks tagged me with the glove and had the ball in the other hand. Ken Burkhardt calls me out. I slide in the home, miss home plate. Sparky comes out and says, you know, get out of here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fine you $5,000 if you get kicked out of the game. I'm only making $10,000. And to see that happening and understand that. And then, I, you know, I put in Alex. I took, Alex said, you know, we needed to take a lasso and tie Bernie Carbo to third base, but the problem was when he said, you're on third base, you got to go on a ground ball, tag up on a fly ball, don't go d double off on a line drive, stay out of the double play. So I did what he did, and then he puts in the paper that I lost the first game of the World mm -hmm. Series. Then he's my manager in, in Milwaukee, Milwaukee. Yeah, and I, do I want to play for this man? And then Zimmer takes over the Boston Red Sox job from Daryl Johnson, he says, how would you like to come back to Boston? Of course I would. And so I get traded to Boston, and then I get traded again. 
So, you know, the 75 World Series, I'm on top of the world. I just hit the home run. I get traded to Milwaukee for Alex Grammis, yeah. where we don't get along. The world's just hitting a home run, thinking, wow, what's this all about? I just get traded. I go to Milwaukee. I'm not getting along there. Zimmer gets the position, and the first thing he says, look, I want you to be at the ballpark on time. The first year I did really well. Of course, the drugs and the alcohol you know, started working in my life, and I started decreasing, coming to the ballpark late and whatever, and I get sold to Cleveland for a box of balls. Yeah. <laughs> It's too bad because you missed the uh, the big uh, uh, pennant race in 78. You got traded to yeah, Cleveland around yeah. May or June, yeah. and you missed the famous Bucky Dent home yeah. run, and uh, you know all that went with it. You might yeah. have been the difference. But, two, I was thinking about this. Jim Rice in 75 was out with a broken wrist. He, was, he, was, he and uh, Fred Lynn were, to me, they were like co-rookies of the year. I mean, it was phenomenal that a team could have two – Two players that uh, that could be so good in their first year, and I thought about that after we spoke on the phone recently. And I thought, geez, I wonder what a difference that would have made. Then I thought, I'll go one further. You might not have had a chance to do what you did if a guy like Jim Rice was uh, was healthy, because he would have been playing, and someone would have gotten squeezed out. You know, um, it was funny when I wrote the book. I went into Boston, and the Red Sox gave me that picture to put on the book, and they were being you were nice, and I went in to sign my book at the um, at the Boston Fenway Park, and I, I saw Jimmy Rice, and I, I said, "Jimmy, here's a book." I said, "Jimmy, I said you're in the book," so he reads it, he finds where he's at, and he starts reading. He says, "Oh, you made a mistake! You made a mistake!" And I said, "Well, what mistake did I make?" He said, "Well, you put in there. It's like losing Tony Perez. It's like losing Johnny Bench." <laughs> and I, I thought, wow, that's pretty funny. He's, he's a Hall of Famer. But the fact is, I, I played with the Cincinnati Reds in 70, 71, 72, and 73 with the big red machine. I was the only player to play with Cincinnati and then play with the Red Sox in that World Series. Right. And without Jimmy Rice, is there was like losing Tony Perez, Johnny Bench, or one of the players, that you know what I'm saying? But the fact is, I played with both teams, and I thought the 1975 Red Sox team was the greatest team I've ever played on. Really? That's high, high praise. In a sense that what happened was, if you look at Joe Morgan, Tony Perez, Pete Rose, David Concepcion, and Johnny Bench on the infield, Hall of Fame. David Concepcion should be in the Hall of Fame. You look at all the players that they had. But our outfield was Carl Yashimsky, Jimmy Rice, Freddie Lynn. Dwight Evans belongs in the Hall yeah. of Fame. So our outfield was unbelievable outfield that we had. We had Rick Burleson with David Concepcion, Joe Morgan with Danny Doyle. Third base, you had Pete Rose. We had Rico Petroselli. First base, we had Carl Yashimsky was playing at first. And, and with your catcher Cecil. is no slouch either. Hey, Carlton Fist <laughs> you know, and I mean, with Bench, so they're both Hall of Famers. So you had two great teams, but I thought our pitching with uh, Louis Tian, Bill Lee, uh, tremendous relief pitching and things like that, I still thought we had the better team. And... You know, that interference play hurt us. But when, when, you know, the thing about it is that game five, we ended up going back to Boston. It rained for three days. And I think people forgot there was even a World Series to be played. Mm -hmm. And game six was played. It was the greatest game ever played. It was tremendous. Dwight Evans making a great play out in the outfield off of Joe Morgan's light drive and home runs and hits and things like that. But when you really think about it, when we went into game seven, Freddie Lynn hit a three-run homer. Right. <clears> and <throat> we're, we're ready to win. So I thought that that was probably one of the greatest World Series ever played. But, you know, as baseball was, I never thought anybody lost. <laughs> no, that uh, even uh, I'll go one further. When the Reds uh, beat you fellas, of course, they went on to win the series. And then even that same... Um, spirit if we want to call that the next year even when they swept the Yankees again guys like Rose and Bench they were people that they were just like having the greatest time so for them those two years not only was their little mini dynasty but again they loved and they treasure I mean I've read stories of all those ex-teammates of yours in addition to the Red Sox too but just what a great game. I mean, people like rounding the base. Hey, this is, isn't this fun? I mean, that's, you know, it sounds like a bunch of school kids. It yeah. almost takes you back to your uh, Monday through Saturday uh, ball games out and out in the parks. Oh, know, yeah. Not Sunday. Definitely. Sunday, yeah. 
uh, Diamond Club Ministries, Baseball with the Spirit. Uh, just uh, talk a little bit about, again, the, uh, the, 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 four, uh, the four bases there, uh, just so yeah. that everyone understands. The desire to know lo the Lord and discipline to not compromise, fellowship to love each other and care for each other, and then evangelists to go out and tell people about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord says, go out and give a testimony. He'll bless your feet and tell people. I, I like to tell people how my life has changed. And it's, uh, it's not by burning carbos, it's by the grace of God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God in me, by the Word, reading and the Word and the truth and praying and being in church and having fellowship and being with my brothers in Christ. You know, as an only child, I always wanted a brother. And now I have a lot of brothers in Jesus Christ. And, I'm, you know, the thing about it, what I love is that, you know, if I came to you, Larry, and say, you know, I'm, I'm having some problems, I'm going to be honest. You know, I have some difficulties with my mind, and I get into my flesh. I'm a little bit prideful and uh, selfish and whatever. And I get a little angry at times, and I have a difficulty sometimes. And I would say, you know what, I need you to have that accountability and pray for me and love me and understand me and so I can come to you and say you know what I'm having a problem mm. and it's not easy and it's it's uh, I love my life I really do and I love what I do with the Diamond Club Ministry and uh, working with kids uh, I run a hitting clinic in Mobile Alabama I teach kids how to hit five years old to 15 to college kids pro kids and whatever and I've been doing it for almost 35 years teaching baseball, teaching hitting, and, and teaching them about how to live their lives. And, and, and the, thing, the thing about it, even from that part of it, is when I, when I go to prisons, you know, when you go to prison, they want you to give these men the gospel of Jesus, and it's uh, giving them hope and an understanding. And what I tell them is to have a personal relationship with the Lord, get into a good church, Find somebody that puts, give you a home or apartment or someplace to live and give you a job. So what happens when most of these guys are in prison, they have a felony. And because of the felony, they're not able to find work or get an apartment because of the felony. And they can't buy a home or anything like this. So 89.9% .9 of them, almost 90% of them go back to prison. And I, I believe that a lot of churches and a lot of business people, and I know a lot of business people, the person I'm staying with right now, Ray McKenzie and Shirley, they own a, a, a screw and bolt company, and he hires guys coming out of prison and gives them a place and a place to work. And I have a friend up in, um, I have a friend up in uh, Vermont that owns a milk farm. We've got 1,200 milk cows and he gets guys coming out of rehab and gives them opportunities to live on the farm and work and things like that so but the hope comes in knowing Jesus Christ and God and allowing these men to know through faith in God that they can turn away from the things that brought them back into prison and into jail it is a high percentage from what I've read of again uh, we'll call it returnees and again uh, to another thing, too, in our, our remaining moments here. We're talking with Bernie Carbo, co-author Saving Bernie Carbo. Again, uh, just a terrific book. Uh, uh, just more, more info than we can possibly cover in, in one, uh, one hour. But, uh, again, uh, I just, uh, you know, enjoyed it thoroughly. But uh, we have rules even in this country. You talked about uh, getting loans or getting this. There was a thing that went on a few years ago where I remember... Um, I was working somewhere just part-time to picking up some extra money and all of a sudden it was an eatery and all of a sudden we had a couple of chef, uh, cooks, whatever, well, where'd they go? Oh, you know, they lied on their application so we had to let them go. I mean, this is like five, seven, ten years and you're going back and dredging that up now? I mean, it's almost like, you know, we're just looking for an excuse to like, you know, penalize people. You know, I grew up uh, with the the thought that okay you've done the crime you do the time and then you have paid your debt you know what i'm saying and I, I guess as i've gotten older i realize no that's not the case you know it's at least not in society so it's difficult it's difficult to get out from under that you know, you know it's been really a, a blessing that my uh, my youngest daughter tamara went to prison for five years for uh distributing and making crystal meth and after five years um the company showed her grace at the Marriott and she started working washing towels and sheets and things like this and she's worked her way up to be 
in charge of housekeeping and, and hiring people. And um, she's, she's hired in taking care of what she does. She loves her job, she loves her work. And now that she's taking care of my grandchildren, the children wanted to live with their mother. She's at a place where she's working. She has a, a home now with my ex-wife and taking on that responsibility of taking her children. It's been remarkable to see how she's progressed but um, someone had to open that door for her and um, taking God into her life and loving the Lord and understanding that Christ has to be the number one thing in her life and in, in our lives. And I still pray for her and myself and my family and my grandchildren to continue to move forward and, and knowing Christ as their personal savior. But it's, you know, the book itself too, the, you know, the, one of the things the book is, is it, it's, it's kind of has some great baseball stories uh, it's got some stories about when uh, I walked in the clubhouse in uh, Boston and, and Fenway Park, and, and I say, they, you know, it's opening day, and it's got, I'm used to one or two writers in the clubhouse, and there's hundreds of writers, oh, yeah. and they say, good, 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 good Italian, good Italian boy, Bernie Carbo, good Italian boy, coming to Boston, opening day, how do you feel? And I look at him and say, no, I'm not Italian, I'm Spanish. <laughs> no, good Italian boy. And the next thing I know, in the paper, it's got Bernie Carbo, good Italian boy, and I come out <clears throat> in Mike Cuellar, playing Baltimore, and he's in the dugout, and he says to me, you're not Italian. I said, I'm Italian in Boston. I'm <laughs> exactly. Italian. So I kind of enjoyed being Italian until I went to New York, and Joe Pepitone says, where's Carbo? Where's Carbo? And I says, hey, Joe, how are you doing? He says, hey, look, you're not Italian. We're going to throw you in the cement. And the next thing I know about... Six, eight, ten months ago, Pennsylvania's Hall of Fame, Italian Hall of Fame, puts me in the Hall of Fame. Nice, nice. There you <laughs> so go. I'm in Italian hey. Hall of Fame. Not only the Red Sox Hall of Fame, I'm in Italian Hall of Fame out of Pennsylvania, Italian Association. So, Larry, that's pretty good, isn't it? That is. You can't catch a break, <laughs> eh? I write it, write it. <laughs> BernieCarbo.com for more information. And again, uh, Saving Bernie Carbo, co written with Dr. Peter Hansis. Again, uh, my compliments to both of you. Dr. Peter did a marvelous job saving Bernie Carbo, the book. Uh, again, so much to talk about. Uh, we hope to uh, have Peter on again, either the next time he's through the area. I want to talk some uh, baseball with him. And real quick, because we only have a couple of seconds, um, Peter Golenbach sends his regards. He says, uh, hell of a hairdresser. So Amen. I, so I said, there you go. Uh, Bernie, again, my pleasure, and thanks for making time while you're in the, the East Coast to uh, stop by and see us. Thank you, Larry. Right. Uh, thank you very much Good for having me, Larry. And uh, we appreciate uh, uh, you joining us again uh, on this episode of Studio 411, and we look forward to uh, visiting with you again very soon. Have a good day.